I'm Glenn Marshall, um, friend of Bob Lanois, longtime friend. We built studios together, rode motorcycles, put on shows. So tell me about how you came to meet and be friends with Bob Lanois. Um, as I recall, I was, uh, was a, when I, actually when I met Bob, I was a little kid. I was 15 years old, something like that. And um, uh, my, one of my buddy's sisters uh, knew Bob and, and um, said, hey, you got to meet this guy. He's got a recording studio in Hamilton. So, of course, being 15 and in a band, me, I, I wanted to meet this guy because he apparently was the guy uh, who had the best studio and he kind of was hooked up to the industry and all the rest of it. Uh, so uh, I think I called Bob possibly once every day for about a year. Uh, and he finally uh, agreed to um, come out to my band's uh, rehearsal space out in York, Ontario, uh, and um, um, check out the band. He came out, I, I picked him up at my grandfather's old um, Pontiac Parisienne, and I think I might have gassed him to death because there was holes in the floor of the car. <laughs> like he, well, I think by the time he got there, he was sick. Um, and anyways, he came out and he, he, uh, he, he gave us a few pointers and um, had a, we just had a nice time. And he, he, he was a very, um, a very generous guy with, with what like, he saw. Whatever he saw, he knew he knew how to always he knew how to to give you what you needed. I see. And so he gave us some tips, and and I eventually turned. I kept calling him, of course, and eventually uh, it turned into uh, a bunch of recording sessions over the years, and and more and more we became friends, and um, he eventually ended up. I set up all kinds of recording studios over the years. Catherine North, I started my house on Catherine Street and then moved it to a church. Uh, he helped me with that. Uh, and in fact, um, I was going to, uh, one of the things about him, I was going to just say about, is he always was able to share something interesting about whatever he was doing. He had an incredible focus and, and a very creative mind. The guy, anything you threw at him, would come back di way differently than you would have expected, yeah. and way better. Super cool. Um, yeah, a very interesting, uh, very interesting way of looking at the world. He was a true Renaissance man. Mm -hmm. There's not many Renaissance men left. Yeah. You know, he could do it all. Like, uh, so, in this case, um, I, I remember one particular story where um, I had just started this new studio. In fact, I moved it from my house, moved it into this church. And um, I said, Bob, I got a new studio. I want to put a studio in a church. Would you take some pictures for me and help me set the studio up? I, you know, we got it all in this big church. You're going to go open concept yeah. like he advocated. Mm -hmm. You know, him and Dan had kind of done a big bunch of recording sessions in the old library. And I was kind of following along with the, with the kind of uh, suggestions that he was making and mm -hmm. listening to the listening to the old wolf, you know? Yeah. And um, so he said, no problem. He said, I'll take a picture of your studio. Just bring your guys, be there early. So showed up, at, you know, eight or nine in the morning. Um, and uh, we proceeded to, for an entire day, move things around. <laughs> he had us, we moved every piece of everything, almost the entire studio was taken out of the building <laughs> and then brought back in and placed. <laughs> And it took a long time. And by the time we were ready to, to, do, the, to do the shot for the studio promotional photo, yeah. um, Bob said, okay, great, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the shot. So he opens his camera up. He looks through the viewfinder, kind of looks at there, and he goes, okay, I'm almost ready. And he has, his, he has this bag, and he goes in the back room, and he changes. He comes back out, and he's wearing black all head to toe. Black hood, like a black hoodie, yeah. or like a, maybe a, like a... Uh, a balaclava, mm -hmm. uh, black everything. Yeah. <clears throat> and he's got a whole a belt with a bunch of flashlights. <laughs> flashlights, gels, different colored lights, yeah. um, three or four different things. And um, he proceeds to, he turns off the lights, 
And then for the next about 45 minutes, he walked around the room with the camera uh, bulb open okay. yeah. and painted the room with light. Wow. Uh, so in other words, like over on this couch, maybe where you'd want to see someone sitting, yeah. he would just go <laughs> for like one, turn it off. <laughs> and then maybe over here, maybe, you, you know, a little bit of red or right. a little bit of just like it looked like the most amazing future world yeah. place. Even there was even one spot where he he um, he used this uh, vintage uh, special effects light that he just turned on for a little while and it put this jiggity jaggedy cool yeah. little corona on the wall. Wow. Anyway, so he did this for about forty five minutes. He clicked the thing off, turned the lights on, said. Took his camera and went, <laughs> like, you know, took the whole, so was he did one shot, one shot on a roll. He, he reels it back into the into the 35 mil can like we would yeah. have in those days. He tosses me the thing <laughs> and says, uh, take that down to the lab. And uh, t he, he mentioned whatever yeah. type of processing needed to be done. It's very specific instructions. Yeah. And I still have the negs. If, um, I still have the negs in the photo. Yeah. And... Um, and yeah, it's one shot on it. One it's shot, 45 minutes. Ballsy. <laughs> Very confident. One shot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so. So pitch black room, Bob's all dark, just flashlight. Yeah. That's excellent. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> what a story. I mean, it just goes to show you his ingenuitive mind. Yeah. Like yeah. people do those kind of time lapse shots, but I've never in my life heard of an architectural shot being done like that. I, I've on film too. On film. I'm digital. You can do it. You can do that all day. But on film, yeah. you don't have the, the the luxury of seeing what you've done. No, and if it no, it was works, totally yeah. up here, and it's a beautiful photo. <laughs> that's excellent. Yeah. Wow, very cool. So that's the kind of that's the kind of magic that he would bring to a situation. Awesome. So tell me some of the things that you learned from Bob in the early days, say at Grant Avenue, that you've carried on with you for your whole life. Well, one one of the things that Bob was always very concerned with when in any setup because he was really concerned about the setup mm -hmm. uh, the, the 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 circumstances for the people working the engineer and producers or or music makers but especially the musicians so the setup for, for, for lighting like one thing that uh, this seems like a, a simple thing but but he always insisted on every every workstation had a light over it <laughs> Even if it was a dark, because we like to work in a lot of dark, mm -hmm. kind of moody atmospheres, but he'd always make sure that everyone had some light over their, uh, over their work area. Um, just, just the 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 comforts of um, having the ability to be the best that you can be in a situation yeah. was very important for him. Um, ergonomics, the way things um, uh, workflow, physical workflow, the way the room is set up. Um, he, um, he had a knack for putting things together and, and making them seem very natural. Okay. Um, so he, that's, I like that aspect of his, um, of his brilliance was, it's hard to share it, but it's just knowing that this is here and that's there and, and it feels right, and it looks right, right. and it and that sets up a, an environment for everyone to be able to, you know, make good music and feel because they feel good, right? You know, right. <clears throat> uh, I remember um, Bob always wanting you to make an advance call to find out, talk to the manager of the band, find out what beer they liked or what or what thing that was, you know, what, what kind of food did they like? <laughs> These kinds of things. It was very, a lot of preparation. When, when, if there was a gig here today, yep. it would be yesterday and the day before, all kinds of preparations, little and big. Right. So very <clears throat> thoughtful. And, very, yeah. very focused on making sure people mm -hmm. got what they needed. Right. And, w w you know, he told me that, um, I remember one time he, when he did a, a little uh, recording of, uh, Bruce Coburn and um, uh, Colin Linden. Mm -hmm. He said to me, and he always stressed this: if you can have the recorder recording 
from the moment the artist opens up their case until the moment they're done, mm -hmm. um, you will get some magic because you will get something that if, if you had just said, oh, hang on a second, I'll be right with you, it would be gone. Right, right. And not every time, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but once in a while you'll catch something that will never ever, you know, yeah. you'd never want to miss. So he was all, that kind of thing. The preparation, I think that mm -hmm. that that's something that setting up a room, you know, setting up the vibe. Right. That that's probably there's so many things, but that's kind of like a, a thing I I would say I've carried all the way through my entire career. Excellent. And, uh, and that's huge. And it's so it is huge. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, so so here we are. We're at the Mule Spinner. So tell me how you guys ended up with this. <clears throat> um, well, like, I mean, we'd, we'd just finished a project out in Brantford. We had this big uh, place called the Brantford Arts Block okay. that had, uh, I guess someone had set up a, uh, an arts thing there, and um, we saw an opportunity to bring our gear in and set up and do a few recordings, and mm -hmm. that would be something we could contribute to it. Right. Um, and so we ended up setting up an amazing space in there, and... Um, uh, it was like a big 10,000 square foot place and um, Bob m made all these big beautiful mobiles which were uh, made out of uh, some uh, sound reflection okay. material that had come out of a theater <laughs> but he Bob was never like he, he never liked uh, you know the idea of like covering up the walls okay. with with uh, with foreign materials right. just for the sake of sound he yeah. had to make it into something artful yeah, yeah um and he so what he did is he took these big panels which were you know on their own quite bland mm -hmm. big square black and he turned it into this giant um mo uh, mobile okay with the help of a friend of ours jerry lafleur who figured out a way with aircraft cable and okay. and some beautiful little connectors could and so so what would happen was um, it just it would it just tamped down this giant room enough to so it didn't wasn't this endless echo. Right. Mm -hmm. It still felt nice and big, but and it would also move very slowly. Oh yeah. Okay. And so it had this beauty and majesty to it. Mm -hmm. So it was a both beautiful and functional. Yeah. Yeah. Which um, you know that was some that was Bob in a nutshell. Cool. And so, so how did that lead to you guys? coming in here well after we were finishing finished that project yeah. we talked about let's find another space mm -hmm. um and i had been doing some things here at the cotton factory in hamilton ontario mm -hmm. canada mm -hmm. and um we we met this old guy who had this diesel mechanic shop named norm okay nice guy um i think he was starting to get ready to maybe he was going to retire okay and he'd had been you know and this place was uh Super, super gross mess. You can imagine. It was yeah. covered in, you know, diesel grease, the whole place yeah. for maybe 50 years. Yeah. Like it was a nightmare. In fact, the owner, I don't think he, re when I said I wanted to take it over, he kind of looked at me with, <laughs> with a bit of a, a bit of a look because nobody thought we could clean it up. Yeah. But I said, Bob, what do you think? We can clean this place? Like, it's no problem. <laughs> so we, we came in here and for about a month washed it with water and dish soap mm -hmm. and we didn't use any kind of chemicals to clean it right that, that, you know bob was very focused on like not making a toxic environment could we clean this place mm -hmm. just using soap yeah yeah so when you know and we did and uh, and we ended up there was a little bit of oil stains on the floor so we just we brought this uh, incredible epoxy paint and just sealed the floor in. right <laughs> so the floors underneath the floors maybe it's still a nightmare but we, right. but we can't see it <laughs> yeah <laughs> what can you tell me about bob lanwell as a person and as a, as a friend well he was a, he was a great friend he was always there for me and he um he he, he helped me really figure out some things when i was young mm -hmm. and then he also was able he also would share with he, he would share with you um, the things that you brought to him. So he was able to, you know, for me as a friend, he, he always would remind me what I did for him, mm, nice. which is nice. Yeah. And especially when someone's done so much for you, right. it kind of evens the, it makes you feel, 
you know, he was yeah, very exactly. always he was very concerned about how other people how other people felt, That's and right. he was concerned with with how how you how are you doing, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, and um, he he had a very kind heart that way, and he was a great listener, even though he could talk your ear off, and you know, you could once you got him started, you couldn't stop him, <laughs> but he could he really could listen. He like he had a lot of he had a lot of dimension that way, so he you know he. He would go. He could. He could go off on some pretty far-reaching tangents. Yeah. But he. Uh, but he. Re when I say he listened, I mean he really heard. What when he asked you something, he really heard you. So. Uh, that's that, uh, that's actually that's really good insight that uh, that nobody else has really said. You're, you're, I'm getting so many different levels of, of Bob and. Uh, Tom Wilson was good at talking about, Bob as as a friend as well, but that's just a whole other aspect of it. Yeah. He. He had a he had a real way of being able to listen into what you were saying. Good, and challenge you too, man. He was a he, like he, he there wasn't a minute wouldn't pass by. He 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 would challenge he would challenge something yeah. that he thought was off. He go he almost you know yeah too much. Well, that's something that another thing that Tom said. He said making a trip to the shack is a trip that you didn't know if you were gonna make it out alive. <laughs> You know, I mean, musicians really hold on to their stuff, right? They yeah. and they tend to want to control everything. And Bob was a control freak too. Right. But I, we, our personalities had a. I had a way of being able to, you know, <laughs> just having that right combination. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, we always had, we had a lot of laughs. You know, he he was a very funny guy. He, he, he was great with imitation. Like he, oh. he could really imitate something. Or yeah. we, we, a, lot, a lot of times we'd get going on some just hilarious uh, pantomimes about some absurd thing. Yeah. And then he, he could really, he'd make people laugh. He was a very, very funny guy. Oh. And that's something that I, I don't know if people talked about that. No. But he was a very, very funny guy. That's good. Mar yeah. Margo, uh, off, off camera, Margo talked about that. And uh, she talked about his laugh and how he liked to make people laugh. But oh, nobody yeah. has spoken to that, so that's excellent. It's good. Well, because there was just so many different elements to him. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it's hard to kind of nail someone down who is so multifaceted. Yeah, good.